Hi there, and welcome to this overview of Six Sigma. As you travel through your journey towards mastery, you will learn and acquire valuable skills in this course. In this first module, we will be covering some of the foundational concepts that Six Sigma is built on. This will include a general background, what Six Sigma is, why it is used, and we will discuss some key concepts that Six Sigma is built on. At the end of this module, you will have a sound understanding and a solid foundation of knowledge that you can build on. Let's begin by looking at the roots of Six Sigma history. Our story begins in 1986 at a company by the name of Motorola. A young engineer by the name of Bill Smith was experimenting with a different method in an effort to improve business processes. Bill believed that by focusing on quality, he could reduce defects in production, resulting in more stable and predictable outputs. During one of his studies, Bill noticed that every business process could be defined, measured, analyzed, improved, and controlled. As time went on, Mr. Smith found that continuing to repeat this method resulted in reduced variations of process outputs, which ultimately helped him to meet customer demands. Bill's new method of continuous improvement became known as Six Sigma. Six Sigma is a strategy that gives organizations a structured means to improve business processes and solve problems. This eventually leads to increased performance, reduced defects, reduced variation, improved use of resources, and more stable and consistent results or outputs. The term Six Sigma comes from a statistical background. Sigma is the term used to indicate variance from a standard or mean average. There are many different Sigma levels. For example, one Sigma would represent 691,462 defects per million opportunities. Six Sigma, on the other hand, refers to a performance level of no more than 3.4 defects per million opportunities. For example, let's say we were playing darts. A bullseye would represent a perfect throw. Because none of us are perfect, we would hit a few bullseyes and a few would hit other points on the board. Most business processes are similar to this. They will produce outputs that are not always defect free. With that said, we can assume that some percentage of outputs will contain either defects or be defective. In Six Sigma, we refer to these deviations as standard deviation. The standard deviation is a statistic that tells you how tight or loose the range of data is in relation to the mean or average of the data. You can read the sigma level by looking first at the number which specifies the amount of deviations from the standard and the Greek symbol sigma, which translated literally means standard deviation. The standard deviation is referred to as a standard because the percentages of amounts that fall into each deviation are generally the same, which gives us the ability to compare the deviation to other data sets. The goal in Six Sigma is to limit the number of defects to, or standard deviations, which is 3.4 defects per million opportunities, or 99.99966% yield rating. With that said, most processes will develop some variation or shift over time. Let's look at our example again. Let's assume we were able to establish a bullseye 99.99966% of the time. One could assume that over a period of time, there would be a gradual change or shift in the process. Like darts, most business processes tend to vary over time. 
to account for this shift or deviation of 3.4 defects per million opportunities, Six Sigma uses a plus or minus 1.5 Sigma shift. This helps ensure that the final results are within specification limits. One of the benefits of quantifying and measuring results is that it takes us away from guesswork and assumptions and identifies results based on facts and data. This naturally requires an organization to gain consensus of metrics that will be used on improvement projects. Six Sigma is also very focused on developing the talents of people. The strategy designates clear roles and responsibilities for people working on projects. It does this by borrowing from the martial arts belt system. Based on the role, skill set, and experience an individual may hold, one of five different belt levels is shown here. Along with these belt levels, the Six Sigma structure also recognizes champions within the organization. Now let's begin understanding one of the most foundational concepts in Six Sigma, the problem solving formula. This formula, the problem solving formula, helps us to understand that every outcome is the result of a process being applied to the inputs. In other words, the outputs are determined by the application of a specific function or functions on the inputs. This idea is oftentimes referred to as determinism and is a principle that stretches all throughout Six Sigma. Let's look at the formula. There are four essential parts we must consider in the problem solving formula. First, we must consider why, which represents the desired outcome, result, or goal we are trying to achieve. For example, if we were baking a loaf of banana bread, the banana bread itself would represent our why. Next, we must consider the inputs that are used to create the why. These inputs are represented by X. X would be the ingredients we use to make the banana bread. To transform our X's into Y's, we need to apply a process as a means of transformation. F represents the function or process applied to our ingredients, which ultimately transforms the ingredients into banana bread. Epsilon is the final part of the problem solving equation that is used to account for any error or the amount of difference from the desired outcome that occurs due to uncertainty when the process is applied. For example, if we made five loaves of banana bread, we may use a slightly lower heat setting, a different amount of a specific ingredient, or we may cook bread for a different amount of time. The end result is banana bread, but each loaf of bread will have some difference or variance between loaves. This variance is represented by epsilon. Y equals FX plus epsilon tells us that all outcomes are determined by the way inputs are transformed according to some said process that is applied to our inputs. This same concept runs through the cause and effect philosophy, which tells us that all inputs, process functions, and even errors will affect the outcome in some way. For example, we can see that if we change our inputs or the process used to make our banana bread, we will end up with a different outcome. This is not always bad, simply different. This introduces us to the basic concept of cause and effect. Looking back at our banana bread, it becomes clear that if we change some elements in the problem solving formula, it will have an impact or effect on the outcome. As you can now see, the cause shows us why something happens and the effect tells us what happens. When we apply this concept to Six Sigma, it allows us to then look at a process and see how the process will allow for variation. 
With that said, we've now covered some foundational concepts that you will build on throughout your journey with Six Sigma. Remember, this is just an overview and we will certainly build on this new knowledge of yours.